how you doing, everyone? We are back with another beautiful Wheel Wednesday podcast. I am Luis from Koenig Wheels, and this is... I'm Rich. <laughs> <laughs> so we're glad to have you guys back. Uh, just a quick... Um, Quick stuff that we want to let you know about. Last week, we actually had our boy Derek Madison on the podcast. If you haven't gotten to check that one out yet, go check that out. That podcast is really cool. That's my boy, man. And every time we have a conversation with him, it's always a good one. And uh, yeah, man, the dude has also been on a tear. He's been doing great this year. So it's definitely a podcast to go check out. And I hope uh, that you guys can go do that. As well as we had an episode of The Hype Is Right uh dropped last friday that was honestly one of the funniest coolest uh uh, videos that we've done in a long time so definitely go check that out as well as this friday we're going to be dropping a car anatomy of the guest that we're going to have today basically he's just going to give us a walk around of his car because we actually went out to lime rock this weekend which from your you know this is the first time you went to a grid life how did you feel about it uh, I thought it was really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, meeting Tom and you know his team and everyone like that. It was a good time. Uh, yeah. Me and Max went up there. We had we had a good time. We got to do a couple of walk arounds with some cool people. Uh, and everyone's gonna be able to see Tom's uh, S2000 this Friday. Yeah, man. Yeah. All right. So, well, with without further ado, we're gonna introduce our guest, which he is a multi SCCA solo champion. He is also a world champ, world uh, challenge champion, two time world ch- challenge champion, and also. Uh, just on a tear in grid life right now, basically number one uh, in his class, the one and only Tom O'Gorman. Woo! Here we go. Woo! There he is. Oh, look at the introduction. There's a whole intro right now, Tom, that you're missing out on, where basically it's just you being highlighted and killing the game. Oh, that's awesome. How's it going, guys? <laughs> Everything's good, man. How's everything on your side? Man, it's been pretty incredible i can't remember actually when the last time i was on here i know i already had my first s2000 and yes that was like 10 years ago even though it was probably one year maybe yeah 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 most. yeah well and, uh, it, so i was we were just looking at it. i think it was two years ago which is crazy mm-hmm. because it feel like it, we had just had that conversation obviously for you 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 know it feels a lot longer but yeah yeah a lot has changed from that time i know that for a fact lots has changed but it's been all it's been surreal like i can't even i can't even believe how good it's been going recently so i have to like knock on wood and stuff every time i think about it so let's you know what and and let's get into it just because i kind of want to talk about exactly that road from the last time we had that podcast you till now because a lot literally has changed so basically tell us what went down at road america to now having well which most people you know if if you're looking at it from a different perspective they don't know that it's a totally different chassis that you're on totally different yeah. car but tell us about what what led you to where you are now uh with this new build sure well for a little bit of context um i race in grid life touring cup with grid life which is their wheel to wheel race series so we're like you know drop the green flag wheel to wheel racing on road courses we do four races a weekend. It's like super intense, super fun to watch. So if you haven't seen it before, you should definitely like go to YouTube and find the streams where they have the races. But um, I did a, I did about a five year stint in pro racing, racing for Honda. And uh, when that ended, I bought a Honda S2000 to race with Gridlife. And after like a year and a half of toiling away and trying to learn how to do it on my own and then getting involved with ASM um, and Andy helping me get the car like really running well and um, started to win some races with it and and things were going really, really well to the point that I was like kind of an outside shot to win last year's championship. Um, If either Jeremy Swenson or Eric Cotille had a bad weekend, it would have been kind of fallen into my lap. So we were racing at Road America. This class is all power to weight. And we realized we were like hitting a drag problem. So we had like, you know, all the, all the power and the weight was right, but the drag was bad. So I I took all the wings off the car. I put some side skirts on it, put an air dam on it. Just tried to make it like a bullet in a straight line, Mm kind of like James Houghton's car is designed to be. If you, uh, if you, yeah, 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 for sure. Yep. Yep. He's got, those are the wheels he runs, right? Right. That's right. He has the, the the heliograms right here. Yeah. Yep. So, so I tried to do that treatment and this, the setup that I built was really bad. Mm -hmm. Um, I ended up crashing the car at turn 13 um, on a practice day, about 80 miles an hour into a concrete wall and uh, oh. ended that chassis life right on the spot. But um, yeah, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. I kind of thought like I'm, I'm done racing for a little while because it was my car that I crashed. I can't just like get another one. 
Um, but I did get, I did buy another rolling shell really, really quickly. And uh, in the maybe two or three months that we had the rolling shell kind of sitting, Andy decided like, let's just build it. Mm. Let's just make it fun. Let's, let's get it out. Let's like, let's not wait. Um, where it probably would have taken me a year or more to get it really running. So we basically pulled a, a ton of stuff, anything salvageable off my old car. We pulled everything off of his shelves that was applicable to the new car. Um, and in like three weeks, the car went from a complete rolling shell uh, or a very incomplete rolling shell, I guess, to a fully caged running race car um, and debuted at Coda earlier this year. And then that chassis has basically become now, I think it's the winningest car in GLTC, at least this season. Um, we've won almost 20 of 32 races. It's and incredible. It's just crazy. Like the car is, the car is invincible as far as I'm concerned. It's the, one of the best cars I've ever driven, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been a journey to get it there. <laughs> so, and, and that's actually a, a good segue into what I wanted to kind of ask you about with when it comes to Andy uh, Smetagard and your relationship with ASM. Like, so where did that come from? Because from uh, from what I, I don't know if it was an existing relationship that you had when we first had our first interview. Is that something new or is that something that already existed and it just kind of rolled into this new chassis and you guys building this up? Because I know there was a lot of changes with the chassis, well, with, with this uh, build, like like you said, with Arrow and all that. Is that with Andy help helping you out and all that? Is that how that works out? Kind of. Um, when I bought my first S2000, I, I'm not a mechanical person like at all. I don't understand cars. I'm not really that interested in cars in, in like the <laughs> mechanics of how they work. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't find, how does an engine work? Interesting. That's not like what I've gravitated to. I want to drive it, right? Yeah. And uh, so I kind of, I kind of don't know what I'm doing. So when I bought my own car. It was like, I got to learn how to do all this again. And, and I was just, it was bad. It was just really bad. I didn't understand how to troubleshoot it, shoot any problems. I kept having kind of weirder problems that were not um, super standard to diagnose, like the engine harness overheated over time and like all of the connectors fell apart. And I'm like, how am I supposed to know that? Anyway, um, so Andy was a resource for me at that point. He kind of, at that point, they've already be, were established as like S2000 masters. Um, they were running one K swapped S2 and then they had a couple other s2000s in the fleet and um i would just bug him on facebook messenger probably more than i should have and he would help me out when i could or you know he helped me out at track side a little bit but um over that period we kind of just stayed in touch more and more and more and then my engine blew up at the end of 2020 mm -hmm. and he just kind of swooped in and was like we're gonna make your car run like it, this is painful for me to watch you deal with all this <laughs> yeah. so he, I, I brought my car up to him um in wisconsin at the time i was living in chicago and uh, that kind of just became like a symbiotic relationship where we realized we work in the same industry. We come at it from very different angles because he runs his race shop. He can build the cars and he, he has this um, event hosting background where they, you know, they started the local sports car club and he just like eats, sleeps and breathes it the same way I do. Mm. And then I come at it from the driver coach realm and, you know, I, I got to do some professional driving um, in pro racing. So we have this whole spectrum covered of like what we can do and what we can accomplish. And we have very similar goals and it just kind of realized like we can really become this like kind of powerhouse within grassroots racing where we have, we can do everything. We can build you a car. We can make you a better driver. We can put on an event for you to come drive at anything in the realm or all at once. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up actually moving up to Wisconsin last um, winter. So oh, now nice. I live, like, the shop is like three quarters of a mile that way. Nice. Um, nice. And I go there most days when I'm here and I drive the trucks to the events with him. And we, we try to, I try to carry my weight as much as possible. I feel like I need him a lot more than he needs me most of the time, but no, that's but, awesome. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 And yeah, just like we started at that, all the ASM social media, try to grow that, start making some YouTube videos, just like anything we can do to, to blow ourselves up, I guess. For sure. For sure. So, uh, and um, one of, because now that we have Rich here too, by the way, this Rich is uh, new on the marketing team, by the way, and I know you met him out in Lime Rock and whatnot. And yeah. uh, one of the things that I kind of wanted to talk about is kind of your journey, because your journey is a very like in depth journey and also very interesting to me as a fan of you. You know, how you've gone from, you know, to where you started to where you are now. Now, um, not to go too in depth into it because I feel like it's such a long story, but uh, and we probably covered a lot of it the last time we had this interview. But give us a quick synopsis of where 
you started to like kind of like the key points to where you are now in GL, you know, going into GLTC and, uh, you know, feel free to always end it when, cause I know there's a lot that that's a big question to ask. So just uh, give us a quick synopsis of, uh, of basically Tom O'Gorman's race car driving life and how it starts. Sure. So I, um, grew up as a racing fan and I always had like racing video games, race, you know, hot wheels cars, whatever, all that stuff was like, it's everything that I ever wanted to do. And I started autocrossing when I was 16. Um, I did autocross for about seven years, really, really deep, started going to like nationals and all the biggest SCCA events. And um, after I, I won my first national championship after seven years of doing that and realized that I could either keep doing that forever or kind of pivot towards driving on racetracks. Um, so I bought a road racing car and got my road racing license in the first year and really wanted to like take that as far as I could and after one year of, cl of club racing, I did a crowdfunding campaign and bought a pro racing car. It was a Honda Fit, so it wasn't anything fancy. But um, the crowdfund campaign got me into Pirelli World Challenge to do my first couple of pro races where I met Honda. Um, and my relationship with Honda by chance or coincidence, whatever, got really strong really fast. They started mm. putting me in cars and I got to race the new Civic SI when that came out in 2016, 17. And then I got to start racing um, TCR Civic Type Rs. They had me testing the NSX GT3, um, and that was my full-time job, yep, yep. was racing for Honda. So uh, that would have been like 2015 through 2020. And then uh, in that time, GLTC and Gridlife were growing huge. And I would always go to the events, and I'd watch all my friends race. And like, I, I never had my own car, but it was fun. It's what I wanted to do if I had my own budget. So when, when the Honda stuff dried up, I got my own GLTC car. And that was like the restart of my racing career almost after – you know, the pro racing stuff had to end. Um, and it was, it was the series I've always wanted to race in. I was never like that captured by any other club racing. I really, really, really wanted to pro race. And then I'm pro racing, watching GLTC going like, I want to do that. And now yeah. I get to. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. Uh, that's kind of how I ended up here. And, and so, and, and this is just an interesting thing for me because, you know, so okay so I, I know the answer to it so but i you know obviously i need to ask just because i think it's an interesting thing what made you get into an s2k so that you can get into these type of racing series like what how did that happen where'd you find it who you know how does that happen yeah honestly i so i had a honda loner streetcar and i had a camaro that i freaking loved uh -huh. and mm -hmm. that was that was like my fun car and my street car. And after I, uh, you know, my Honda contract lapsed and I, I was basically unemployed, I had to give the Honda vehicle back. And then I had this Camaro and I was like, I don't need this. This is a stupid street car to have. Like I'll just sell this thing and get something half. So I sold the Camaro and I bought an S2000, like a street car. Mm -hmm. And pretty much the day I bought that street car, a friend of mine messaged me and was like, Hey, I didn't know you're looking for S2s, but there's a guy maybe selling his race car. If you want a race car, you can buy it. And three days later, I bought that race car. So it was like very coincidental, but it was like oh. right place, right time, right price. Kind yeah, of thing. yeah, yeah. And I literally, I sold the street car for what I bought for it. And I bought the race car for what I bought the street car for. So it was just oh. like pivoted that around. And then I bought a cheap tow vehicle and a cheap trailer. And that was how I started with it. But I, I, I'd like to say I picked an S2000 on purpose, like very strategically, but I kind of didn't. I just, it, it happened to be what I wanted for the street and then a race one popped up yeah nice nice that's really cool man so um so since the last time we spoke i know tomo drive it like uh driving instructing has changed a lot i feel like you've grown a lot also with that as well uh i noticed that you've also teamed up with asm and you're offering uh different types of courses when it comes to this even online stuff that we've noticed that you've been doing tell us a little bit about that and uh and yeah tell us a little bit about about, about the the tomo driving and whatnot yeah so after my pro racing job basically ended um i was like i gotta figure out how to work i i, I don't really have a lot of practical work experience i don't want to just go get a desk job so what do yeah. i do and one thing that I've been doing for a long time is driver coaching, but usually pretty informally or just like as a one-off job instructing for this school here or there. And I kind of realized like that's the easiest way, not the easiest, but the, the most plug and play of the things that I could do for a living. It's like I could start my own coaching business. 
So I started to kind of pull from the experiences of doing the, doing the driver coaching at different tracks and different events and different schools and figuring out like what's going to work best for me. And the most common driver coaching model is a private coach that you hire for the day. They come to the track. Um, it's pretty expensive. You pay them like a full day rate. They give you all their attention. You get all of the, you know, the data, the video, the review. They watch you on track. They're your companion on, on the, the whole day, whether you're on or off the track. Mm -hmm. um, and because that's expensive, a lot of our grassroots friends can't really afford that. So I wanted to build, I, I do do that. And there are people who absolutely that that's super beneficial if you can pull it off. But I wanted to build models that were affordable for, for our friends that maybe have a couple hundred bucks to go a little bit faster. And instead of like buying a, a new part, they're going to buy uh, a little bit of investment in themselves or, um, you know, they're going to sleep in their car instead of getting a hotel and, and pay for a weekend of coaching to get a little bit better. I kind of wanted to, to accommodate that because I feel like that's what I would have needed if I, if I was getting a coach when I was 17, I, I couldn't afford a thousand bucks a day, but I could afford yeah. 200 maybe. So what I built is what I call my trackside coaching where, it's all the events I already go to, all the grid life events, so some SCCA events, all this other stuff. And when I'm when I'm on the ground, I'll work with a small group of people that are already at that event as well to try to make sure that they can maximize their event, but also can grow as a driver over time. So there are drivers I work with once, there are drivers I've worked with the entire grid life season, every event. And it's it's designed to be a little bit more of a quantity than a you know, I'm not working with just one person. I get to work with five to seven people. So it helps me cover my costs a little bit. It's a little bit better for, for me business-wise, but it's also totally um, dedicated to those people when I'm at the track, unless I'm sitting in my car. So, you know, if you don't see me driving my GLTC car, you probably won't see me much because I'm in the trailer working with another driver or, you know, kind of working my way around the paddock, finding my, my clients. For sure. Um, and then I also do remote coaching where I don't even go to the track. I kind of call in the Tuesday before and the Tuesday after, and we talk about going into the event. I'll, I'll, you know, we'll talk through the track. We'll talk through some goals during your event. You can apply that as much as possible. And then the Tuesday after, as an example, the, we'll call in and we'll review video, we'll review data and figure out, did you succeed? Where were your successes? Where were the things you can continue to work on? And I try to design that around, you know, working at least three to five times together so that we can measure growth and, and actually kind of, quantify are you are you improving as a driver are we building your ability to learn on your own um because it takes time it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of like instant feedback so if, if we're not doing it in a timely manner then it's going to be tougher to learn too so i'm kind of learning all of the different ways those models work i'm kind of learning how to be an educator yeah. more than a, you know i know i know the driving part but the educating somebody else i'm kind of learning my teaching methods more so than my driving methods for and sure, for sure the rest of it is like um business management and time management and, and stuff like that it's it's a lot of uh, a lot of the learning process for sure cool cool but and, so uh, and and sorry if, if you if if you had mentioned it so and you also do like private lessons as well and stuff like that and is that just something like kind of like uh how does that like do you have to come out to you or is it just, you know, you offer it obviously through online or whatnot? How does that work? Or do you go to a track? Do you have somewhere that you work from? Yeah. The, the full private coaching model. Like I, I go to the event you want me to come to. Ah. I, you know, okay, I don't okay, go okay. myself. I don't bring my car. I, I literally just show up with all of my coaching tools. That's right. And okay. Focus on, on the other driver. So that's kind of like, I, part of it is setting expectations, right? Like if, if you're working with me, as one of seven drivers on a grid life weekend, mm -hmm. I have to set the expectation that first I'm competing and that is only, you know, it's, it's got my schedule fixed to a, to an extent. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm not competing, my, my bandwidth is hundred percent on you guys, but there's seven of you. So I, I have a schedule built where I try to make sure that no one's time is getting wasted. Mm -hmm. um, but I also have to manage my own time pretty strategically or else I get behind or, uh, you know, my worst nightmare would be to tell someone I just don't have time right now. Yeah, that yeah, be, yeah. That's not acceptable to me because it's my job um, is for me to have time for them. So it's it's been a little bit of like I don't know anybody else that coaches in that way. So I'm kind of building my own little coaching industry from that model. <laughs> and yeah. I have to figure out if it's going to work or not. So far, I think it's been working. Um, but it's kind of dialing in the balance of quantity and quality to make sure that I'm not biting off too much. But I'm also um, delivering a good product for those for those drivers. Of course. You know, it's, it's really cool because it's not like it, realistically, there's not many people offering what you're offering. And I think it's really cool that especially someone with so much accolade kind of.
being able to kind of be hands on with you and get give you direction on something that's honestly really difficult and competitive, man. So kudos to you to even attempting it and obviously being successful in it. But another thing that I find very interesting is kind of the online stuff that you've been doing recently, which is the the track tips and the uh, track breakdown videos and stuff like that. When did you start that? And uh, and tell us a little bit about what you're okay. trying to do there. Uh, is it something that's more directional towards come kind of doing in person stuff, or is that just you putting your your brand out there? Sure, um, that actually grew out of something Andy was doing already. So Andy had uh, on uh, a I channel see, called Boosted Films. Boosted Films uh, is our buddy Paul. He would make these videos with Andy for they were called ASM Track Tips, um, and they pretty much did them for all of the tracks that Andy knows pretty well. So they had already done you know like the Autobahns and the Gingermans and the the road Atlanta's, you know, kind of the stuff that they visited. But in my, my experience as a driver, I've gotten to visit all these other tracks that he had not been to yet. Mm. So when I came into the ASM group and I started kind of realizing the places where I could build the ASM brand that were not already tapped out. Um, one of them is like, well, I have at least two dozen other tracks on this track tips list that I could fill in. So we just started filming a bunch of track tips videos for all the tracks I've been to that that either Andy or someone else hadn't been to yet. So now we have we went from kind of the Midwest typical tracks that that he mastered and known really well to now we have like Laguna Seca and Mosport and Lime Rock and all, all these tracks that I got to go to for either pro racing or or different stuff. Um, that now we I think we pretty much have every major U.S. track across the country covered for a track tips video, and I think. I guess I didn't think about it strategically. Like, what is this for? It just seemed like mm -hmm. we should do that. Yeah. Um, but, but uh, you, there was a point we were going to maybe put them like you buy each video or like there is a subscription service or something. And it was like, you know what, let's just put them out there. Let it be marketing for coaching, but also just be a way that ASM is a, um, what do you call that? When you're a master in the field, like yeah. when you, when, when you're seeking information in motorsports, who do you go to come to ASM? Cause we know, whether it's track tips or s2000 swaps or anything like we i think putting the videos out there on uh youtube i think putting them out there for free for people to watch i think it's a really good idea because then someone uh can see what you guys have to say whether it's you or andy and uh if those free tip you know tips on the track work for them they're gonna say these guys know what they're talking about i really want to you know, maybe get in front of them and do a little more with that. I think that might kind of also translate to, you know, some future clients uh, for your, you know, the private coaching for Tomo coaching. No, no, yeah, for sure. It's like, like, cause even I'm thinking about it. So entertain me here, Tom, cause you know, don't make too much fun of me here, but <laughs> I, so I have, I have, um, uh, uh, a, Oh my God. My I'm blanking on my own car here. Oh, Ford Fiesta. <laughs> I have a Ford Fiesta that I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking about it. So mind you, it's a thinking about autocrossing, you know, and the thing is, it's just one of those things that it's like, you don't know really where to start when you've never done it. You know what I'm saying? Obviously there's, you know, especially luckily me being able to work here and stuff like that and having conversations with cool people like yourself, there's obviously people I can add, ask advice for, but sometimes it's not that easy. You know, maybe yep. you're busy or maybe other people are busy that I know and whatnot. And you know, giving tips to someone who's just starting is not as easy as being like, yo, so having something like yourself, a service like yourself, where we can kind of say like, Hey, or, or go on YouTube and, and, you know, starter tips. Cause sometimes having that conversation is a little difficult. Having those starter tips being there is honestly very helpful yeah, for the person sure. who doesn't know where to go, doesn't know how to start. You know, it's a helpful thing to do. Even the tracks, you know, like doing the track things, maybe I'm going to go to Lime Rock and I'm like, you know, I don't know anything about Lime Rock. All of a sudden, I, I fall into your video, and it's giving me a whole layout on how it works. And that's yep. really helpful, dude. I think there's something I've seen over the last, like, five to seven years that, like, the gatekeeping of motorsports has fallen down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So before, it was, like, there was autocross, but it's not it's not easy to just, like, immerse into and understand. Um, or there there are track days, but how do you find them? Or, you know, like, there's always an exactly. instructor to immediately put with you to, to babysit you. There was never a lot of, like... We're just going to break down the barrier of entry to be as minimal as possible so that it's easy and fun and relatable and you can just like come in and be safe but enjoy yourself and i feel like overall like motorsports as an industry in the last five to seven years has like let's stop protecting this sacred thing that we, we want you to feel like you you don't really relate to like let's make it as relatable as possible let's make it as easy and possible to get involved in 
and make as many people as want to like be able to show up yeah which yeah. i think like duh why wouldn't you do that but i remember my first autocross events it was just like overwhelmed it didn't feel like a lot of people wanted to help um it was very very like just crash course learning and like if i could make somebody else's experience getting in either easier or more fun or a little bit safer because they, they're a little bit better edu educated um all of that is like a huge win right of course yeah no way oh, I'm good. <laughs> okay so no so what i wanted to ask is like as far as like when it comes to uh tomo coaching is it just you specifically by yourself or do you have like uh like other instructors that are working under you how does that is it just or is, is it just a tom o'gorman you get him when you're working when you uh join the team yeah it's just me right now um this is my first year kind of having been doing it formally so I've, i spent 2020 and 2021 like doing it under the table a little not under the table but like uh very informally word of mouth um just trying to like figure out if it, can i even handle doing this is this something i want to do or do i need to like go get a desk job and over those two years is where I came up with those three different coaching models. And I learned a lot of strategies that I feel very confident in my own time management and the, the way I communicate the information, um, the way I can kind of read what the person needs and, and adjust to them. So like one driver may have this whole set of vocabulary that they get, and then another driver ha doesn't know any of that vocabulary. So I have to like completely take this race car driver verbiage out of my, my, my language and just talk to them at, at a level they understand. I spent like two years honing on that a little bit before I even just said like Tomo coaching is a thing. Um, so the day that I like announced the business earlier this, this winter and formalized it and it was on a website and it's marketed, that was like the most stressful day. <laughs> I could imagine. It was just yeah. like, this is becoming, this is real from this point on, this is real. This is my job. There's a tax ID number associated with it. There's yeah. A yeah. Yeah. Like all of that stuff was like, all right, that's, that's awesome um, man. but yeah i'm still learning and it's still my first year so right now i don't have any uh mini coaches or any uh, auxiliary people it's just me that's awesome well so all right so another thing i wanted to kind of get into is you know let's talk about what's going on right now so my boys here mm -hmm. they got to see you at work man they went to, to lime rock they they got to see you finish first place you're on a tear right now. You're the, you're the number one on the leading boards when it comes to GLTC. One of the things I wanted to know is the things that you can tell us, what are some of the changes that you guys have done this with this S2000, this bill specifically, that uh, you can at least tell us about that you have changed from the last, although you kind of briefly kind of told us, but kind of going into depth of why you feel this this year is more, like not that it's more successful, but meaning it's more smooth, I think. You know, it it's is. running more smoothly. What what yeah. are those changes that you guys made in this season as compared to the last? So last year I did most of the season in my own car before I, before I crashed it. And that old car just was never quite right. It was... Like even the days that it was good and fast, like you could blindfold me and put me in all the ASM cars. And I would have been like, that was five S 2000s. And then like, I don't know what that one was, mm -hmm. but it was, it, it was good, but it wasn't the same car. Like it was just a little left field all the time. And it was felt like the front end, the disc and the rear were like disconnected. So like the front end would respond one way, but the rear end would be on a delay and respond a different way. It was just, I don't know what it was, but to be honest, I'm, there's a silver lining in having crashed it because I feel like I would have been dealing with it for the rest of however long. Um, and I don't know that it really wanted to be a race car anymore because it was like a 13 year old, 14 year old build. <laughs> so, so starting with this new one, we're like, let's, we're going to build the ultimate, you know, we're starting as scratch as possible. There's literally just like rolling suspension and brakes on this chassis. Um, so even starting with the cage, we built the cage into the front shock towers. Um, the cage was, you know, ideally there to, to strengthen the chassis as much as possible, connect the front and the rear as much as possible. So our buddy Artsum built the cage with all of the check marks of like, do you, do you want all of these like little, little touches that are, um, good for that? So even just from the root, we started with that. Um, a lot of the stuff that went on the first, the first round build of this car was kind of similar to my old car. And it also wasn't wasn't awesome it was better but it was not like you know we were still on pretty basic shocks we were still on um 
pretty basic arrow that we're allowed in the class. Like we're allowed to build an under tray that goes back to the front axle, if that makes sense. So yep. think about a splitter, a splitter is designed to make front downforce, but really about 70 to 80% of the effectiveness of the splitter is just the flat tray that goes back to the axle. Mm. So we don't have the splitter, but we have the under tray now on the car and just little things like that. Yeah. It started to really add up. Um, but the big change was getting some like really proper race shocks. We went to some Moton double adjustable shocks um, and the under tray both went on at the same time. And the car went from like, it was capable of winning races. I had won some races and then that was at Autobahn and I've won 14 of the last 16 races since that change. So I feel like we, we honestly haven't, there's, there's definitely no secrets with it. It's basically like all of the other cars have most of what my car has, but my car has all of it and it has the best of it, whether it's the shock brand or the diff or the arrow um, or the, the brakes, like all of it is the best we know of that works. And um, I think just piecing that all together, I, I, I can't believe how fast our cars are. Like yeah. we're going so much faster than we should every new track we go to people from nasa or people from scca are like you did what lap time on street tires what yeah like the but the sum of the parts just created this i, I basically say it's like a s2000 gt3 car it's like bonkers yeah. how the car is um so once we made those changes and kind of built this ultimate like i got little chills talking about <laughs> <I love that. laughs> nice, once we nice. got to that point it was like i've been dealing with with handling issues and with cars I'm not happy with for, for a year and a half, two years, all of my own doing, right? It was my car. So now that it's good, there's no excuse for me not to be able to win races. Like it's just, it's just on me. So if I, if I don't win a race, that's like my own fault now, yeah. which is a really nice spot to be. And I love that the excuse of the car is gone from a driving perspective, but it's also like a testament to the ASM, like knowledge pool, like over the last five years for S2000s we've created this car and now I think Andy's finished second. Most of those races, our buddy, Matt Waldbaum is in the top five every single time. We just did that same kind of, we're calling it like an Evo kit on the, the ASMS 2000s. Uh, our buddy Zach just got all of that stuff done to his car too. So it's like all not necessary, but as soon as you kind of, if you get as close to that as possible, all of a sudden you have this ridiculous car and uh, Zach had just driven it for the first time at Lime Rock and he kept coming up. So, do you have an awesome race car? Because I have an awesome race car. Hey, I told you how awesome my race car is. It's so awesome. Like he was stoked about it the same way I was when we finished mine. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I, th I think it's it's really down to those small details. Like, do you have do you have the off the shelf eBay shocks or do you have like full proper two way Moton race shocks? Mm -hmm. And I never would have thought that that would have been like a huge change that it was, but it, it was. So when you when you start to nitpick those details on the level we're competing at. It, it all adds up really quick. Yeah, and, and that's one of the, actually, what I wanted to kind of talk about when it comes to these races. And obviously, uh, Lime Rock is one of those ones. Like, for example, to me, two of my favorite drivers is yourself and Eric Kutel. You know, and Eric Kutel coming back with his uh, with his build and whatnot. When, yeah. when, when you're on that track, and, you know, not to kind of get, you know, get the, the what, what can I say, like... Uh, Stir the pot. That's the right. He said <laughs> that's yeah. the back said it. You could hear that to stir the pot right. a little bit. But when right. you're on that track, who are you looking for when you're looking to your left to your right? Because I, you know, I need to stir the pot a little bit here. I know you guys, you sure. know, you there's there's a little bit of competitiveness there, and I love it. And I kind of have to stir it a little bit. So, sure. first of all, I'm like so freaking stoked that Eric's back because Eric's one of my absolute best friends. Like. I would go to his house when I lived in Cincinnati. He lived in Columbus. That's right. I would go yeah. to his and hang it. Like he was the benchmark when I came in with my first car and I was finishing 17th and he's winning races. Like, man, I can't wait to be able to like be a thorn in your side, Eric. And as then, you have, as you are, as <laughs> right. I, I was getting there. And then both of us literally at road America within two weeks of each other, both totaled our cars. That's right. So it was That's like, right. we we're, we, we kind of went through this journey together. Right. And now that he's finally back, it's like so freaking cool. And the car is like fast out of the box, which is not like perfect fast, but it's pretty yeah. damn good. Yeah. So, um, I mean, Eric was always one. The first one for me is Andy because we're sense. driving basically the same car. That's right. So like, if Andy's beating me and I'm in, you know, we're pretty much identical cars, then that's, that's for me to figure out. Um, 
for example, last year in Kansas, we showed up and I, I drove the track in one way in one section. He drove that section a different way. And he put like eight tenths on me every single lap. And after that session, he was like, I did this time and I did this time. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm so slow. <laughs> and then, you know, I, I can pull the data and we can compare and we can figure out that I was making a line choice that was different. And then I'm like, I can go make that tweak. So for me, the first benchmark is Andy, because as a driver, he's one of the best I know. And as a from the car side, like we're in very similar equipment. Mm-hmm. Um, outside of that, definitely Eric and I mean Jeremy. Swenson, who's in the Corvette. That's right. That's right. Like he's in a very different vehicle package than we're in. So his strengths and our weaknesses tend to align and vice versa. But he's just, uh, he came into GLTC from Time Attack and went on this crash course of learning racecraft and learning a new driving, uh, sorry, like a racing model. You know, Time Attack is the single fastest lap. Racing is like a totally different rhythm to the weekend. And he got super good at it really fast. Mm. And like the guy to beat so he won the championship last year that's right mm-hmm. and, uh, and having that sort of first just watching somebody get into into wheel-to-wheel racing and have to get good at it that quickly yep. and he was like really impressive um so i have a ton of respect for jeremy but i also he's kind of the benchmark for who to beat um sure. and i know this like this year i don't think he's won a race since coda but he's i think his finishing average position is like second like 2.1 or something like his yeah. finishing thing um so he's the one that kind of pushes us awesome. at every like if it's not andy or i it's probably a purple corvette <laughs> for sure for sure that's awesome hopefully i don't stir the pot too much because i know you know no. <laughs> the good thing is, is tom you're good at kind of being like all right i'm not you know <laughs> like start too bad you know but, yeah but the, um I mean, part okay is, we don't really race with anybody who's a problem so like we're basically all buddies and awesome. when we're like who's who's the one you worry about it's like a friendly thing it's not like uh, nemesis guy yeah. maybe it'd be more fun for everybody else if we were nemesis but nemeses <laughs> uh all right so i feel like when it comes to you know and not to but i i feel like you've kind of sealed the fate of how this season's gonna end a little bit you know <laughs> you know that's just my personal opinion you know uh but what i wanted to kind of ask is when it comes to tomo racing and asm motorsports is this where it stops is there something that you guys go further from from here? What does the future look like for Tomo Racing? I have no idea yet. That's, <laughs> um, honestly, I did not expect this year to go like this, like at all, um, yeah. considering I was ending last year with a total race car. So I hadn't thought about it a lot. And one thing I did think about a lot over the last two years is if you if you were to put me down, you know, in my 21st birthday or something, 18th birthday, like, what are your goals in life? I would have put down like pro racing, I would have put down like factory driver, I would have put down driving certain, you know, track, whatever. And in the in the last five to seven years, I got to do basically everything that I could come up with that I want to do, which, had, which when it ended kind of left me with like, well, now what do I want to do? I have no idea. And on one side, it's like, I've already done everything that I would want to do. But on the other side, now it's like, I get to do whatever I want. Like I can, so I have to remember to think that way. Like I can create whatever thing that I want to do next, just because I already accomplished all these other goals. Doesn't mean I can't set new ones. So I've been trying to think through like, what do I want to do? Um, it's been kind of fun getting into like different disciplines. Like we do a lot of ice racing up here in Wisconsin. We do Ooh. a lot of thing with ASM. Um, Robert Thorne's in pro spec formula drift at this point. That's um, right. That's right. Yep. That's, I think they were head to head in the grade eight. Yeah. At, uh, St. Louis. So yeah, anyway, yeah. like that is really interesting. And it's all these new motorsports things that I've never been exposed to. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know. Like we've been starting to talk, like, I don't know if we want to race the S2000 and GLTC again next year. Maybe we want to go endurance racing or maybe Ooh. we want a totally different car or, um, you know, there's, there's tons of options, but. I'm thinking of them a lot earlier than I thought I would have because I thought I was going to be in a couple more seasons of, of GLTC with this car trying to master it. And now now that we got it where it is, it's like we got to keep coming up with new stuff, I guess. It I don't seems really like a know. good problem to have. <laughs> it is a good problem to have. It's, <laughs> it it, that's a, that's that why I asked the question because I'm like, you know, when you're so dominant and, you know, uh, you know, uh, you have to ask that question. Like, what's next? You know, because 
you know, I mean, you could do another season and probably dominate again. <laughs> you know, but but that's just, you know, but then again, it's, you know, that's the fun part about it. And just like you said, you know, the, the sky's the limit, especially when it comes to motorsports in general. You know, there's so many options. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, it's just one of those questions that I definitely wanted to ask you, you know. Yeah, the hard part with grip racing is there's only so far you can go in the grassroots world before you're just into pro That's level. Right. So, like, the next logical step from GLTC would probably be something like that MX-5 Cup or, like, that GR86 Cup that just got announced. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they're immediately into quarter-million-dollar, half-of-million-dollar budgets just to do something very similar to what we're doing now. So that's kind of why all these new disciplines are so interesting to me because I don't have to go straight, you know, there, to go higher – than what I'm doing now is not such a stretch versus if I wanted to go higher level grip racing, the, but I, there just isn't the, the dollar to do that. So yeah. Yeah. Plus it's not, it wouldn't be rewarding. I don't think, I think I'm, I think GLTC and grid life in general are like the best amplified, best vibes, best presentation. Like it, all the opportunities are already there from it. So I kind of want to keep doing it to an extent. Well, um, but then there's also like endurance racing, which we could have one car and four drivers and a team of eight people. And like, it's, it's a way more community driven thing um, in something like WRL or I, I don't know what, but it seems like those S2000s should do pretty well there too. I would think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's fun. It's, it's funny that you mentioned that too, because from, even from starting here to where grid life has gone now. Um, and we're hoping that next year, that's kind of the stops is that one of the stops that we're going to make is Midwest because that, you know, Midwest is, is a vibe in general. Like it's just, you know, there's so much going on and you know, it's just honestly, it's probably definitely one of the top when it comes to like the growth in like pro-am and whatnot. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a place to go to when it comes to this motorsport thing. Like they offer everything. And honestly, it's just, yeah, we're for sure fans of, of what Chris and the team over there have done. And, yeah, man, I, I get you. I get why you're kind of like, yeah, I don't know if I would go anywhere else because it's where you need to be right now at this point, yeah. you know. But all right, cool. So last thing I kind of want to get to is we have some fan questions. These are very generic questions. So we wanted to kind of ask you this and, you know, you answer them how you feel is best. All right. Sure. So, all right. What is Tom's daily driver? That's one of the questions that we got. So I have a, a Lexus GX470 cool. SUV. <laughs> And a Acura Vigor, like a 1993 Acura Vigor that I bought for nine, 600 bucks. Nice. It's like a cylinder front wheel drive Acura sedan. Sounds like an Audi. It's really cool. But I alternate whichever one has more gas in it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Cool. All right. So another question. So from what we know so far, what are your thoughts on the new Civic Type R? The new, new one. Yeah, I think the it new. looks awesome. I think it looks a little more grown up. I think it looks like very, very handsome. Um, the other one was like a little hot boy. And this one's like hot boy grew up and got a cool job, but he still has a little rowdy in him kind of thing. Like it's a great I think way to put it. Do you, do you think it's something that you, you see yourself hopping into and working on or no? Just... I would love to. So I do still have a pretty decent relationship with Honda. Like even if I don't work with them, like I yeah. still have a relationship with all the, the, the engineers and all the people I met there. So um, I got to go to the Thunder Hill 25 hour last year and nice. just kind of crew on they were running. What were we running? Um, oh, a new Civic, the new Civic. Um, SI? SI? Yeah. The sedan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I have a little bit of exposure to that. And like, I know they'll probably get some type bars at some point uh, or maybe like an accurate version of it. If yeah. that ever happened. So uh, maybe, I don't know. It'd be fun. Ooh, yep, yep. Cool. All right. So uh, on one of the podcasts that I was listening to, you had mentioned that you're a big fan of Mexican food. Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to go more generic when it comes to the Mexican food. The question was Chipotle or Qdoba, which one would you do? Ooh. All right. So there's the question and then there's the topic. The question, the answer to the question is Chipotle for sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> but when we're talking about Mexican, like I'm, I'm like a connoisseur of the Mexican oh, restaurant. Okay. And okay. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> After a day at the racetrack, like I want to go to a Mexican restaurant and there's like re requirements, right? So like when you're looking at Google images or like maps and you find the right one, it has to have like the stylized chairs and like the right decor. Like you've got to have that vibe, right? <laughs> That's how you know it's legit. Yep. 
yeah. it better have like i want the chips and the salsa on the table the same time my butt hits the seat like immediately there's t- chips and salsa on the table right i get that and that i get margaritas has to come in like the little bowl it's like the, the little fishbowl chalice margaritas like okay. those are the and then beyond that i'm happy whatever whatever you serve me because usually i'll be you know so, i'll have the margarita half gone and be full of chips so what's your go-to <laughs> but what's your go like what's your go-to like plate like if you had to pick one is it like a, a quesadilla is it oh chicken fajitas fajitas okay how about you yep. me uh no one just regular tacos normally carnitas or something like that okay yeah well so tom if you ever so my parents are from el salvador have you okay. ever had what we call a pupusa no but okay. i'm also aware that the mexican restaurants i'm talking about are not real mexican food or like <laughs> anyway <laughs> so next time, next time, if you ever come this direction or for, you know, because last time, actually, when you, he actually came to Formula Drift to support his teammate and uh, I didn't get to see you that time because we had left and bailed and you were with the team and whatnot. But the next time yep. we, we run into each other, I definitely got to take you to have some Salvadorian food. I actually took Max to have a pupusa, which El Salvador, Mexico, we're kind of, you know, similar because it's right under Mexico and stuff like that. So uh, basically... What it is is it's the same thing, the same ingredient that all you know Mexican food is tortilla with stuff in it. <laughs> so that's what it is. The next time you come out here, I gotta definitely have you uh, uh, have some of that and make sure that the, the decor is right. Yeah, you know, yeah we gotta yeah. make sure that the margarita is right. <laughs> then the pupusa. I'll go out, in there right? early and I'll buy chips Dude, and salsa. Down. We'll put it chips down before you guys be out there. Yeah, yeah. You have all that. <laughs> yeah. All right. When it comes to what, what's your favorite music and genre? Like if you were if if you were out there, what are you listening to? Um, I lick like really upbeat, um, somewhere in the like eighties retro synth wave, like oh. disco realm. A I little get bit. that. Like, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of a band to, to so, reference. So, so Max was kind of putting me on to, um, Odessa. He likes Odessa. Sure. It's, Cause it, it's kind of that vibe I would think, right? No. Uh, what else? I don't know. I like so now when we're talking about bands that I like, I like like um, oh shoot, it's they they wear wigs and they're like a band. Oh man, it's not it's not yeah. gonna come to my head right now. And it, th- then there's like a drummer in the background. Damn, okay. it's all right. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, like the, yeah. the go-to artist right now would be like uh, Krung Luz- Bin. What is it? Krung Bin. I don't know that one. No. That I'll send. Uh, I'll send it to you. I'll send you some. Okay. You'll probably dig it for sure. Yeah. Um. There's like, TWRP is a really good one. They're like, jam band, funk, synth, rock. I don't know how to describe. I don't know how to describe the genre that I listen to, but it's yeah. very specific. Sophie Tucker is really good. That's like kind of more, uh, more DJ. I don't know what, but okay. Yeah. okay. All right. All right. All right. Um. So and then this is actually a question from. From Max and we kind of wanted to talk about it is um, so on your build you have a hashtag that says race as one right mm-hmm. race as one it's hashtag eight, race as one what does that mean so that specific sticker um, it's hashtag we race as one it's actually from we form- race as one okay yeah so Formula One has been doing a huge amount of like um, promotion with you know pride months and um, just overall, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just like everybody is equal and there's there's no room for unacceptance in Formula One. So so a bunch of drivers have those We Race as One stickers. And if you remember, like the pace car had the rainbow on the side and there's usually like lots of stuff like that. But uh, for me, it kind of expands bigger. Um, I am gay and mm-hmm. I've been out since I was 17 or 18. I've never tried to make a big deal of it. Mo- pretty much everybody knows Um in in every level that I've raced at and whatever it's it's I've always had a really positive experience with being able to be myself um, without being very scared of it and the more comfortable I've been expressing myself the more accepting people have been in racing so you know when I was 17 18 and I was very shy and I, I didn't really want to you know make a big deal of it I wanted to blend in versus now when I've got a freaking rainbow in my car and bleached blonde hair and you know I, I present myself very differently now than I did then but either way I've always been fully accepted and empowered really is the right word to be like whatever I want to be. Um, so I was always 
hesitant to present that, especially the wrong way when I was pro racing for sure. I did talk to Honda about like, you know, like maybe we could do some pride month after activation or something. And they never quite knew what to do with it. I definitely didn't know what to do with it, but, um, because I've always had such an empowering experience, I feel like it's important for me to help others have that too. So, um, there's a couple of new organizations that came around that have helped me lean into that a little bit more for lack of a better term. So, mm -hmm. Um, racing pride is UK based. They work with formula one. They work with a lot of pro racing in the, in the UK and Europe, and, um, they just expanded into the U S so I'm one of their ambassadors and, um, out motorsports is based here in the U S and they're very much more like a grassroots hub. So I have like this pro racing down from the UK side from racing pride and out motorsports is like grassroots up here in the U S. And just working with those groups and realizing the situation I'm in, especially now that I'm just racing for myself, it's like, I don't have to worry about Honda or pro racing or any, anything else. It's like just whatever I want to present. Um, my first S2000, I had a rainbow on the bumper and this current one, we did a pride month livery with a, with a rainbow gradient all over the car. And then we kind of kept that with the ASM wrap that's now on it. It's got, you know, a nice rainbow ish gradient. Yep, yep. Kind of. mm -hmm. we saw Either that. way. If you just told me 10 years ago that I was going to race a rainbow car, I never would have believed you. But now it feels it feels important and it, it feels like. Like I want to give back a little bit anyway, or yeah, of course, I'll create that. And that's part of the reason I feel grid life is they're, they're partners with the same groups that I'm a partner with uh, or, you know, ambassadors for. They want to make sure that it's it's accepting. It's definitely the most diverse, whether it be race or gender or sexual orientation, or whatever of any motorsports org that I've been a part of. And I don't know, it just feels like, um, if I got to have a good experience, I should create good experiences for others. So hopefully by me trying to be as authentic with myself as I want to be, then other people get to as well, which feels like the way it should be. That's amazing, man. Like, yeah, I, and I think that's one of the things that we emphasize here the most is, you know, when we have these conversations, we like to have conversations with people that are, you know, bring out their genuine selves. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what your background is, where you come from, where it is. At the end of the day, we all have something in common, which is we love cars and that should be it. And, you know, wherever, wherever they are, you know, whatever sexual orientation or uh, where they come from or what race they are, it shouldn't matter. You know what I mean? Yep. But at the same time, representation like yourself and putting it out there, it's also a beautiful thing because you know, we're all together, as this says, we race as one, man. We're just mm -hmm. people, and we just want to be people, and we want to race together, and it shouldn't matter, you know? So yeah. that's awesome that you represent that, man. And, you know, we're all, we obviously here to support you along the way as well, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, and I get – every once in a while, it'll come up with the, like, well, why does it matter? And I know that the person that says that always comes from a good place. They're saying, like, I don't care. Why should anybody else care? Why? But mm -hmm. when you're going to your very first event ever as – Maybe, maybe you're, you know, even motorsports is mostly like white guys at most levels. Like yeah. if you're showing anything at motorsports and you're not anything but like a straight white male, you're immediately other in some way that makes, makes it intimidating. So whether you're, whether you're gay or a different race or a female showing up to motorsports, like all of those things, if you're not seeing yourself represented anywhere, it's going to be harder to be yourself going in. So on a level, yeah, why does it matter? But at the same time, if I can be the one reference point that makes someone else a little more comfortable or, you know, any of the female drivers have a little bit of that platform going on or any of the insert anything here, um, I think it's super important for that to be at least acknowledged rather than just like not talked about because in the perfect world, it'll not be talked about ever, but we're not there yet. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. I, yeah, I think it's a hard thing because, uh, you know, when you say that you want to, you know, you had a good time in all this and you want to be able to, uh, you know, make someone else have the same kind of experience that you had, uh, you don't get a lot of feedback on stuff like that. So, you know, it kind of might feel like you're kind of like the unsung hero in this, you know, if, if people are going to have an easier time because of it, because of you. Um, you might not get that feedback right away, even though, you, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know up front that you help someone. So, you know, sure. I, I think it's a great thing. It really is. Yeah, and, and, and completely and, necessary. And 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 I say this with is some sort of experience, like what you just said. You know, uh, being from my background, being Latino and whatnot, and 
you know, it, just like you said, sometimes it is a little intimidating because it's not someone that I could say, oh, this person looks like me. I, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's a little bit easier or or, or, or um, I know this person has a similar background to me. So it makes it easier for me to have that conversation with that person. You know, so having someone like you be a representative uh, and let's say someone that comes with similar, you know, has a similar uh, um, situation as yourself, it'd probably be like, well, if he could do it, I could do it too. And that honestly goes a long way, you know what I mean? Huh? Because it could change the course of a whole person's life, you know? So it's honestly, like, I, I, I genuinely mean that, that that's awesome that you're representing that way and putting it out there, you know what I mean? Because it's not easy. So for sure. Took a while, but I'm there. But... Awesome, awesome. All right. So, all right. So I think we've taken enough of your time. Tom, thank you so much for always joining us, for always like being willing to do these these things with us because i know you have a lot going on and so we really appreciate your time dude i'm down anytime thank you yeah. man i appreciate well, also congrats on lime rock oh, yeah and congrats. a great season so far yeah yeah thank so, what's what's well, coming uh, up next what's what's next for you and the team so uh coming up we've got robert's finale he's leading the pro prospect championship in formula drift so we're all going to that hell yeah uh, basically like a heads-up match between he and uh, Dmitry Brutsky, I think. That's in They're Utah. Like, uh, yeah, in that's, Utah. Yep, yep. Two or three weeks. Um, we have two more Grid Life events. Alpine Horizon is the last like normal season race, and then we have Kansas, which is the finale. Awesome. Um, I've already won all five of my allotted weekends, so I just need to finish. I think twelfth at the finale, Damn. which I'm like, <laughs> as long as the car doesn't break, that yeah. I, I don't know why I didn't say that. Yeah, um, knock on wood, knock yeah, on wood. Knock I'm, on uh, wood. I'm hopefully going to autocross nationals, so the nationals uh, in a couple of weeks, maybe try to win another championship there. Um, I'm commentating the SCCA runoffs, so you can mm. tune in to me talk about racing instead of be the race car driver. Um, some coaching, and yeah, just keeping, keeping going. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, you already know we wish you all the success. We're here if you need anything from us. Uh, maybe you want to put these new wheels on. You tell me when you're ready. Cool. Yeah, it'd be pretty cool. <laughs> All right. But uh, yeah, thank you again, Tom. And uh, yeah, you have a good one and we'll see you soon. Thanks a lot, guys. Later, man. See you later, Tom. Yeah, man. So to me, one of like, and I always say this, I feel like I always say this when we end these conversations. One Ooh, of my I just lost audio. About having these combos is getting real with some of some of, you know, our, our much, which our friends, me and Tom text all the time and stuff like that. And, you know, I think this podcast gives you a doorway to be able to get personal with those people. But also, if you're a fan of someone like Tom, you get to see another side of him. And I think that was beautiful. That last part of the conversation, honestly, was one of my favorite uh, parts of the combo that we've had on this podcast alone. You know, so. Of course, if you if you look at everyone's just, you know, stats and points after the races, you only see that kind of, you know, side of them. But there's a lot more to every single one of these racers. You know, yep. everyone has their own story, uh, you know. Everyone comes their own way. Yeah. Well, anyways, guys, with that said, thank you so much for joining us on another beautiful Wheel Wednesday podcast. I say beautiful Wheel Wednesday podcast because I love to put positivity out there because it's a beautiful Wednesday. Enjoy it. And I'm glad that you're here to join us. Hype is right us. on Friday. That's right. So, no, no. So, Hype is right at, oh, last, was last yeah, Friday. Yeah. <laughs> this Friday, we're actually doing a car anatomy, which is right. our word for a car walk around that we're going to be doing of our guests uh asm s2000 which you're gonna you're gonna be able to see in depth every part of that car so if you had any uh inkling of what you wanted to see on that this is the time to do it on friday we'll be dropping that uh we're here every wednesday uh at 3 p.m as well as we go live uh on 2 p.m where scott kind of answers any questions that you guys want to answer you come join us at 2 p.m on our instagram or facebook and we'll answer literally any question you want to ask we'll answer it right then and there again guys thank you for joining us uh, and yeah, have a great one. Peace. Peace.